Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and um, the recording is available um, for you to watch later at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where we um, have all of our recordings for you. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share, spread the word um, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, for those of you not um, local here in Nebraska, uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, similar to your state library. Um, and we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find topics, um, show topics on Encompass Live for all types of libraries. Uh, public, academic, K-12, uh, corrections, museums, archives, historical societies, et cetera, et cetera. Really our only criteria is something that library, it's to do with libraries, uh, something cool libraries are doing, um, things we think they could be doing, book reviews, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations for us on services and programs we offer um, here, but we also bring in guest speakers um, as we, and that's what we have this morning. Um, with us today is Laura Hinman. Good morning, Laura. Good morning. And she's a library director at our Midland University here, in, uh, the Luther Library at the Midland University here in Fremont, Nebraska. And she's going to talk to us about OER, big topic in libraries, <laughs> um, but this one specifically about doing it at her uh, small liberal arts um, college university. Um, and I'll um, mention too, this is a um, Something that's been a lot, like as I said, talked about a lot, and so I'm very interested to hear what has gone on and how you've been dealing with it there at Midland, Laura. So I will um, hand it over to you to take it away and tell us all about it. Sure. Um, so again, my name is Laura Hinman. I'm the library director at Midland University. Um, I've been here for about almost three years. I started um, July of 2019. Um, so today, my presentation is the pros and cons of implementing OER at my university. We're a small private liberal arts university. Um, just really quick about me. Um, I'm from originally from South Dakota. I graduated from DSU with my BS in English for New Media. And then I received my MLIS and grad certificate in archives and special collections from the University of Southern Miss in 2018. And I started in public libraries first, um, kind of jumping around in different branches there. And then that led me here to Midland um, in Fremont as the library director. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the studies that I have found about um, students having to purchase expensive textbooks um, and what it all, um, what they have found to be difficult about it. Um, and then the current textbook prices here at Midland. Um, and then some co comparable OER possibilities for um, in replacement for those Midland textbooks that are so expensive. And then some OER resources that I have found. Um, and if you don't want to utilize OER resources, I've also found other affordable textbook options that are also available. Um, and then some libguides on OER that I found a lot of my information from. And I did this presentation to my faculty last February. Um, because as the library director, I hear a lot of I guess kind of complaints from the students about not being able to afford uh, their textbooks and all the mm -hmm. textbooks that they have to purchase. Um, and so it's it's a really hot topic here, especially with you know us being a private university. Um, we don't have the cheapest tuition, I guess. Um, so adding on that extra uh, payment <clears throat> for textbooks have been has been an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so this um, I just wanted to kind of inform the faculty here that this is a possibility that you um, can adopt instead of having your students purchase those textbooks. Um, I didn't get any, you know, horrible pushback um, 
but um, I don't know how ready they are to um, move to something like this. But I just wanted to give them the tools to kind of start searching. Mm -hmm. Um, something that came sometimes I know when I worked in university, the students come to the library, whether they know they have it or not, looking to borrow the textbooks. Yep. <laughs> and yeah, that's not usually a thing, <laughs> unfortunately. Yep. And I, I kind of mentioned that too later on in my presentation about what students are doing in place of purchasing textbooks, and that's a big one. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> So um, the current difficulties right now with having to purchase expensive textbooks, this is what I um, have noticed here um, for how students cope with the cost of the textbooks. Um, so a lot of students will purchase an older edition, which you know sometimes it has the similar information. Sometimes obviously there's updated information, and so you know it's not going to work well with the class. You know the page numbers obviously are going to be different. Everything's going to be different. So that isn't always the best thing for the students to do they'll delay purchasing the textbook so they'll go to the class you know um, see if the instructor is going to use the textbook or if they're just you know utilizing their lectures and powerpoints and so they'll delay purchasing it they'll not purchase it at all um, they'll share their textbook amongst their peers um, they'll find a downloadable version, which that can be a problem because it might not, again, be the same book. They might be getting it from, you know, websites that probably aren't, you know, the legal <laughs> websites um, or uploaded to the website legally. Um, they'll utilize closed reserve. Um, and if you don't know what closed reserve is, so we have um, a shelf here that has textbooks available to the students um, that either the professor provides for their class or unfortunately I'm sometimes having to purchase the textbooks out of my budget. Um, and so the students think, oh, well, we have it on closed reserve, we can just use that. The problem with that though is they can only utilize the book for three hours at a time and they can only have it in the library. So, you know, if you have to utilize it in the classroom, they can't. Um, so that's not helpful to them. You know, if they go home for the weekend, have to do homework, again, they don't have the textbook. So closed reserve also isn't a great um, thing to use for them. Um, another problem I hear is when admissions are doing their tours and they come into the library, a big thing I hear from the admission ambassadors is, oh, well, I never bought my textbooks because all of them are on closed reserve, so you don't have to buy any of your textbooks. And the problem with that is, you know, while we have these, we don't have textbooks for every class. So, um, you know, it kind of becomes a bummer to the students that start coming here and they're like, oh, I thought all my textbooks were up here and they're not. Um, and then also the biggest one that um, bothers me is they'll try to utilize interlibrary loan. And what the students don't understand is an interlibrary loan is just like checking out a book from a library. You only get it for two to three weeks. And obviously for a student, they need it for the whole semester. And so it'll either be they won't return the book and I'm you know, trying to hound them to bring it back and they won't because they need it for the whole semester. And um, so I've tried to stop them from um, utilizing interlibrary loan. But if you know somebody gets to that request before me, it doesn't always work. But um, yeah, so these are the different ways that students try to cope with the cost of textbooks. Um, this is from a 2018 student textbook survey that I found, um, and these are their, their key findings. This kind of correlates with my previous slide. Um, obviously, with them not purchasing the textbooks, it negatively impacts their access, success, and completion of courses. Um, the biggest one that I hear um, that's um, frustrating to students is there'll be a textbook that's required, but then it never gets really utilized in the course. Um, and then again, they're reducing costs by a variety of means, um, like I mentioned in the previous um, slide. I actually just had a student come to me yesterday that um, she donated um, a couple of her textbooks from last semester. Um, that's She told me I could use it for closed reserve, and she said that it was for a class that not, um, it was required class people had to take, but it was a class that they didn't necessarily want to take. It was just a required one. And so they didn't want to purchase the textbook. And so the few people that did, they were just taking pictures of the pages and the chapters and sending them out to the rest of the students. Um, 
So obviously, again, this is happening <laughs> right here at Midland. Um, and this is just a table from that survey, again, showing um, kind of a breakdown that this is, uh, the survey is from um, some university and colleges in Florida. Um, but this is just kind of a breakdown of, of how many students are paying, you know, at in each interval of um, dollar amounts. And you can see, you know, almost 1600 students are paying between the 500 and $600 amount. And that, again, doesn't include the tuition that they also have to pay for. So, um, it's a lot of money that obviously puts a lot of stress on the students. Um, and this is um, the top five percentage answers reported by students when asked about the impact of textbook costs. So they're either not purchasing the, the required textbook, they take fewer courses, which means they have to purchase fewer textbooks. They don't register for a specific course because they know that course has a really expensive textbook or they'll just earn a poor grade because they can't buy the textbook anyway, or they'll just drop the course altogether. Um, and this is, uh, again, from the previous slide, but kind of a breakdown um, comparing between 2016 and 2018. Um, but those are the top reasons, you know, what happens when we have these expensive textbooks for students to be purchasing. And this is a link to that survey if you wanted to. Um, take a look at more information on there when I share my slides. Um, this is linked out to that survey, so you can um, look at that if you want. Um, but I found it really interesting and um, provided a lot of information about this problem. And I'll mention here too, since you're mentioning that in the slides, that um, yes, after um, when we have the recording up for today's show, um, we will have a link to Laura's slides and all of those um, embedded links and everything. You'll have access to everything. Yep, and this is also, uh, um, an article I found on a database about the efficacy of open textbook adoption. Um, and it's basically saying that um, they're either withdrawing from the course or receiving a low grade because of the high textbook costs. But it showed based on the study that students um, would be less likely to withdraw if there was an a free open textbook available for the class. Um, so right now what it looks like at Midland um, I have a breakdown here of what a typical freshman um, textbook cost is from the Midland Bookstore. Um, for their first semester, they're usually taking their first math class, biology, speech, and um, English comp. And so the first column is purchasing the textbooks as new. And as you can see, um, it's right around the 400 to $475 range. And this again, isn't including, you know, our, our tuition is around $36,000. And that doesn't include room and board and, you know, the meal plan. So on top of all that, they're having to spend that $400 on textbooks. Um, there are some used rental and ebook options, as you see in the other um, columns, but not all of them are available in those other options to save some money. Um, so they're obviously spending a lot of money in their just the, their first semester as a college student. Um, so that adding that added stress of being a new college student and now having to spend all this money on textbook is a huge, I guess, eye opener for those students. Um, so this next slide, so comparable OER textbook options. So each class that I have from this slide I found comparable OER textbooks on the websites that I'm going to show you in these slides coming up here. So first of all, what is open educational resources? They are teaching and learning materials that can be used and reused freely at no cost and without copyright issues. Um, so that first one for the math textbook, here's a college algebra textbook that I found using um, one of the OER websites that I'm going to talk about. It's available online in the app that they have, or the they have a PDF option. Um, and they're always updating the textbooks that are available. This last, this one, um, the last update was June 22nd of 21. Um, so this is an option for that um, first college algebra class. Um, then that biology class, again, available in different ways to read it. Um, it's been updated in July. Um, this one is that speech class. Um, this one is on another website that I found. 
Um, this one last update is 2019. And all of these with the um, titles underlined public speaking open textbook, that's the link out to the textbook if you wanted to look more into that. So all of these have those links there to look. Um, and then the reading and um, writing course, our English comp class. Um, so these are all available you know, as OER options if the faculty wanted to um, take the time to adopt these textbooks into the course instead of having them purchase them. Um, so next I have um, some slides showing what OER websites that I have found. And these are the sites that I um, presented to the faculty to show them around, show them what resources are out there. Um, I mean, nowadays there's a lot of resources available to um, our faculty to provide those free resources to our students. Um, I was actually surprised at how many resources there were out there. Um, and a big one that I, one of my favorites is OpenStax. Um, there's an option to sign into OpenStax as either a student or an educator, and each one has their, um, you know, positives, their resources available. Um, if you sign in as a student, you get access to tutor assignments, highlighted study materials. Um, if you sign in as an instructor, you get access, um, locked instruction, instructor content and free resources integrated with your book. You can browse by subject. All the textbooks are available as a PDF in the app or online. And now they just implemented something called OpenStax Tutor. So for a small fee, um, you can um, pay for uh, OpenStax Tutor to help you in each um, textbook that um, you're looking at for your class. And I think it's just $10, so it's not a huge fee for that. But there's that option in OpenStax. Um, and then again, OpenStax as a student, um, you can highlight in, in the textbook and you can revisit those highlighted portions under the My Highlights um, tab there. Um, there's reading and note-taking guides um, for college success, study tips, note-taking strategies. And then there's a time management guide to help students if, you know, as freshmen, they might not have a lot of experience um, juggling a bunch of um, you know, extracurriculars and um, your classes as well. So there's some um, time management guides in there uh, for the students to utilize. And then um, again, OpenStax as an instructor, there's a Canvas course cartridge. I think they also have it for Blackboard and D2L. So if you use any of those LMSs in your um, university. Um, so if you if you adopt a textbook, you can use the course cartridge. It has already built out, you know, assignments, syllabi. Um, so you really don't have to start from scratch when you adopt an OER textbook from OpenStax. There's a cartridge that you can integrate into your LMS. That's nice. I'm sure that's something professors or you know the faculty would think of is like, I have to redo everything just to switch to this new textbook. That's a lot. But there's built yeah, it, in, it's already kind of built in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that was the one um, I mentioned that at the end. That's one of the big cons that I heard was I have to start from completely from the beginning. And, you know, if you adopt a textbook from OpenStax, technically you don't have to because they have those cartridges built out for you. Um, obviously, you have to, you know, if you have a specific assignment or test that you want to build out, you'll have to create that. But it's really not from scratch. It really helps you um, build out that course. Mm -hmm. So I found that, I don't know, super helpful in my opinion, but. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, OpenStax as an instructor, there's PowerPoint slides available um, for each book that you adopt. Um, and there's also sample syllabi. Um, so if you don't wanna create your syllabi from scratch, there's help right there. Um, and then they also started um, an OpenStax hub. And this is really cool. So um, each textbook has a specific hub and um, you can log into that hub and visit with other professors that have also adopted that textbook. And they will share some resources that they've created, syllabi that they've created. Um, you can um, 
talk one on one with those professors and you know ask them advice when they adopted the textbook. So um, that hub that they created, I think, is really helpful um, for professors that are just starting out and not really knowing um, where to start. Um, so I thought I thought that was really cool that they started that. Um, so here's the link out to OpenStax, and I was just going to um, go in there and kind of show you around. Are you seeing the OpenStax website? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. That's good. So I'm logged in right now. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, again, for instructors, you've got that LMS integration. So those Canvas course cartridges, there's PowerPoint slides, test banks, answer guides. Um, and then you can browse by subject. Um, again, I talked about that OpenStax tutor. Um, so we'll go into the subjects. Um, so here's math. This is again where I found that college algebra textbook. Um, and even if you're, I think they have stuff for high school too. So if you're needing stuff for high school, not just college, they have that information. Um, so they have math, they have science, social sciences, humanities, business, there's a huge amount of information here um, that's available. And um, I believe they have, um, I guess for, for my school, a big class that has the most expensive textbook is anatomy and physiology. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to, oh, here it is right here, um, talk to the anatomy and physiology professor to try to um, implement this textbook instead because it's about a three to $400 textbook. Um, so I've been trying to um, have him utilize this instead to kind of help out because it's normally the nursing majors that have to take that. Mm -hmm. um, he hasn't done it yet, but I'm hoping that he'll start soon. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you um, click on one of those books, um, again, there, you got the table of contents. You can look at it online on the app or PDF. You can either either um, even order a print copy if you want to. Um, and then again, it tells you when it was last updated right there. Um, and then there's your instructor resources. So there's your um, LMS integration if you want Canvas, Blackboard, or D2L, and you just download it right into there. Um, here's that um, hub that I, uh, visit the hub that I talked about. Um, so if you um, use this textbook, you can go to the hub and see what other resources are um, are out there from the other instructors that have been using this. And there's those um, PowerPoint slides and sample syllabi that I mentioned. And then for the student resources, there's the note taking and um, time management guide that I mentioned as well. So um, personally, I really like OpenStax. That's kind of one of my favorites. It has a lot of options available for you. Um, again, it's got that LMS integration, so you don't have to start from scratch. So personally, I really like the OpenStax um, the best for OER. Um, but that's kind of what it looks like for that option. Um, the next option that's out there is called the Open Textbook Library. Um, right now that has about 840 open textbooks available. Um, that number changes all the time because they upload new um, textbooks all the time. Um, several are listed currently in development. These textbooks are all available as a PDF, Word, or ebook format. And again, you can browse by subjects. So when we click on that, this is what it looks like. Um, it's a little bit different from OpenStax where this is um, basically just strictly textbooks instead of the extras that mm -hmm. OpenStax offers. Um, but it um, shows you the new books that are available uh, right now. Um, and then you can browse by subject again, just like OpenStax. Um, so we can look at um, look at this one for example um, learning in the digital age it provides reviews um, if people um, in, liked the book or not and then um, it gives you that copyright year again so you know how updated it is and here you can get it as an online and pdf um, 
I guess I can show you what it looks like when you look at the online version. So it gives you the table of contents right away and then it has you scroll through the book. Um, so that's um, open textbook library. Again, it's just strictly textbooks, um, but it's just another resource to find more books available for you. And then um, the next one is OER Commons. And that one is a central hub for all things open source. This one um, has more than just textbooks. There's also um, articles available. There's mini lessons, there's simulations. Um, you can filter by a specific subject area. So education level, material type, media format. And there's also full university courses in there too. Um, so you can, um, utilize that as an example if you decide to adopt one of the textbooks and you can look at the university courses that are available and kind of build your course out from what's um, available on OER Commons. And what I love about those simulations, um, so example you're a nursing major and you're working on maybe the um, how blood pumps through the heart or something like that and they actually have a simulation of how that works and it's a video of showing um, how the blood flows and everything. So I love those simulations that are available on OER Commons. Um, and that's what this is what that looks like. Um, you can again search what you're looking for. You can do it by subject area, education level. Um, and these are the different um, like common core math and different ways things are taught now. Um, so you can look at that as well. Um, I'll just search um, mathematics for an example. So if you look over here on the left, um, we're looking at mathematics and you can break it down by the different subject areas, um, the education level material type. So if you want like a lab or a case study um, or something interactive, lesson plan modules, that simulation, um, syllabi, textbook, there's just a huge amount of information here. So if you want to use, um, you know, different resources besides the textbooks to show students how to, you know, do something within that course or within that um, subject, all of this information is here for you. There's games, there's the full course here again that I um, mentioned that you can um, use an, as an example when you're building out your course. So there's a huge amount of information here on OER Commons. Um, and then you can look at media type. So there's audio, um, interactive, video, ebook. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of um, stuff here to utilize. Um, and then this is what the textbook option looks like. Um, And once you click on it, you just click on view resource. A lot of the information on OER Commons, they um, work with the other OER websites that I mentioned. So sometimes it, the textbook that they show here, they're pulling straight from Open Textbook Library. So I mentioned that in my previous slide. So they're um, working with the other OER and putting everything in one on one website. Um, So that's kind of what OER Commons looks like. Yeah, th that was something that we did have a question. I was going to jump in and ask. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure what you were, if you had other options to show, but uh, wanted to know, could a professor mix and match from these different OER sites? Like, is the same textbook going to be on multiple sites with mul different resources, or is each site have just its textbooks, I guess is the question. So I'm... Um, um, I'm thinking that each one has different options. Um, nope. I mean, if, if one math professor is utilizing different math textbooks, I mean, if they're utilizing different books for different classes, they could mix and match. Yeah. Um, but they're going to provide different resources on each website. But OER Commons, that's kind of pooling all of the resources from all of those OER websites into one website. 
Um, that would be a good place to start if you wanted to see what right. was available everywhere to then decide which one is the best that you want to go with. Right. And then um, also, like I said, it's not just textbooks. It's also those, you know, course, full courses. There's mm -hmm. simulations, labs for like biology or yeah. um, chemistry or whatever. Um, so there's a bunch of options on um, OER Commons. And then there's also at Rutgers University, they have a community repository. Um, so this is free access to scholarly open access. Um, so uh, a lot of it is um, scholarly articles, electronic theses and dissertations. There's histor historical and cultural resources and digitized archives and supplementary resources. Um, so this is kind of a cool place like um, if your professor wants to utilize journal articles and you don't have you know, access to that specific article or database or whatever, we, you can go on to Rutgers and um, look at what they have in their um, community repository and um, utilize it from there. Um, I mean, it's basically just like looking at a database. I really love this idea. Um, you know, they put their scholarly work, um, things that are even published from there and they make it open to the public. Um, so I love that, but um, it's basically like searching in a database here. You search right in the search box of what you're looking for, but this is also available if you're not just looking for textbooks and you're looking for um, scholarly articles or supplementary resources, this is a good place to go. And this is other OER websites that I found. So there's Open Course Library, and that includes textbooks, syllabi, course activities, readings and assessments. Um, there's 81 college courses on there, 42 have been completed so far. Um, and it also provides faculty with a high quality affordable option that will cost students no more than $30 for textbooks. So it will, um, might provide textbooks that you have to purchase on there, but they're super cheap um, options. There's um, MIT Open Courseware. So it's a web-based publication of almost all of MIT course content. So if you're trying to build out a course, um, there's a lot of course, full course content options um, straight from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. There's also Merlot um, that has over 35,000 open course materials. And then there's the Milne Open Textbooks, and that's from the um, SUNY faculty and staff peer-reviewed open textbooks um, that are authored by the SUNY um, faculty and staff there. Um, and I don't have to go into these um, links. Um, if you want to look at them from my um, presentation, you can. But it's basically like all those other websites. There's a search box there. You can search by a subject um, or course that you're looking at and it provides you all of the resources right there. There we go. So if you aren't able to adopt OER, um, but you still wanna provide affordable textbook options for your students, there's other options out there um, rather than purchasing those expensive textbooks. And one of them, um, it's from Cengage, it's called Cengage Unlimited. Um, the perk to this, um, um, well, what has to be done for this is all of your professors have to agree to adopt their textbook from Cengage for this to really um, help the students. Um, so if they adopt all their textbooks from Cengage, then they can pay for Cengage Unlimited e-textbooks um, for $70 for four months. They can get all of their textbooks, um, both e-textbooks e and hard copy rentals. Um, so they only pay that one flat price for the four months for the semester, and they'll get all their textbooks. And it also um, includes um, college success tips, career success tips, um, study tools. So there's one option there. And then there's the other Cengage Unlimited plan, which is a little bit more expensive. It's about $120 for four months. Um, but this also includes the MindTap. So if um, 
I think that's math and biology, I think it's the online portion of the class. Um, so it not only includes the textbooks, but also that online with the access codes, um, it includes that as well. Um, and then you have the options on both of those if you want the four months, the one year or the two year options. And then the price fluctuates based on what you choose. Um, but even though it does cost to use this, it's significantly cheaper than, you know, buying individual textbooks for, you know, a hundred bucks a piece or something. Now they're just paying one flat fee for all of their textbooks, as long as your professors are all using Cengage. Um, and this is kind of uh, gives you a breakdown between Cengage Unlimited um, and the extras, the online portion of Cengage Unlimited. It tells you based on the check marks what, you, what each of them includes. Um, and you can show more benefits to give you more information. And then that's where you can change your um, plan and then you can buy that way. Um, I believe like on my slide, you can do um, a trial run with it to see if it, you know, is something that you want to utilize. Um, but again, if you're not able to do OER, this is going to be a great um, extra resource instead um, mm -hmm. if you want to use it that way. Um, the next one is called Perlego. This is an online textbook subscription service, and this one is $18. Um, if you decide to pay monthly, it's $18 a month. If you decide to pay yearly, then it drops down to $12 a month. Um, so $144 will be billed annually. And on this website, it's an option for a 14-day free trial. And this is unlimited access to the textbooks you need. Um, it has built-in study tools. You can read it anywhere on your iPad or computer or smartphone. Um, and this is kind of what Perlego looks like. And again, with this one, again, all of your professors, or you know, at least most of your professors, to make it, um, you know, make sense, they have to adopt their textbooks from this website. Um, but the nice thing about Perlego too is. Um, if you don't like it, you can change or cancel your plan at any time without any um, fees, cancellation fees or anything like that. So um, what I found with the cons when I presented to um, the faculty on this um, presentation, again, I, I didn't, <laughs> Directly, I didn't get any bad feedback. I just heard it from others. Um, um, one of the things I heard is, is I think they thought that I was um, asked to create this presentation from, I don't know, maybe the higher ups or something. Um, because one of the responses I got is, are they expecting us to do this now that she gave us this presentation? The only reason I gave this presentation is because I knew this was out there. I knew it was a problem with the students. And so I just wanted to give the tools to our faculty. Um, mm -hmm. yep. So nobody told me to do this presentation. I just wanted to provide it. Um, the biggest one was building a Canvas course from scratch, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we have professors here that have been here for years, and so they are you know, utilizing basically the same, you know, assignments, tests, and quizzes. They might change a little bit, but not very much. They've been using the same textbook for years, um, so they never have to change anything. It's not, you know, much work on their end um, to have to change anything. Um, and so having to, you know, find a book, read it, build the whole course content, that's one of the big cons. You know, if they use OpenStax, there is that cartridge there for them, so it they don't have to do it from scratch, but they would have to be open to doing that. Um, and then um, for the second bullet, um, the hesitant on the validity of the books. So our nursing faculty, um, I guess it would be a big example for this one. Um, obviously, they're going to be wanting that evidence-based um, textbooks because that's what they're you know that they're um 
coursework it relies heavily on, obviously. Um, and so they're concerned. I don't know if it's because it's freely available and it's free. Um, they're worried about the validity of the textbooks. Um, but my the biggest thing that I hear from the students is like on the positive side, their textbooks are built into their tuition. Um, so they automatically get their textbooks at the beginning of every semester because there's a faculty member that are buying these textbooks for the students. So they're all set up to go for each semester. Um, and it's nice for the nursing faculty because then they don't have students who don't have the textbook or who, who are waiting on a textbook. The downside to doing that is they're purchasing all new textbooks. Um, so there's no room for possible um, like saving money because they're not looking at rentals or used books. It's all brand new purchased books. Um, and then they're also having them buy the ebook and the textbook. So that's like double purchasing. Um, hmm. Not one or the other, but both. Right, both, yep. Um, so I hear a lot of, you know, complaints about the amount of money that's being spent on those books. Um, and a lot of, like I showed, you know, there's that ad anatomy and physiology book on there um, on the OpenStax website. Um, so there, the resources are out there. It's just, again, the faculty have to go in and see what books match the best for their course. Um, another thing about Midland is um, Midland is very adjunct heavy. So um, hmm. we have about, I don't know if it's like 36 full-time faculty and the rest are adjunct. Um, so we have over twice as many adjuncts here. Um, and so what, what I've seen a lot is when adjuncts choose their textbooks, um, they've never had to choose a textbook before because they have either come in just graduated as a student or they've been out of teaching for a while and they're just coming back for a part-time job. Um, and so they might not know how to um, choose a correct textbook to use. And so a lot of times I'm seeing that the textbook that they're um, choosing for the students is either only available to be sold um, on Amazon by third-party sellers. And usually with those third-party sellers, they're um, jacking up the price. So if it's like a $60 book, and it's not available anywhere except from that third party set third party seller they're jacking it up to like three hundred dollars for the book um so i see a lot of that um or they're just um finding textbooks that are just more expensive than they need to be there's more you know cheaper options out there so they're not um they're not being mindful of you know what the students are already spending their money on in other courses plus tuition and everything um and then with adjuncts you know they come and go so we get new adjuncts every semester and some of them either stay you know several semesters or they leave um and so it's hard for me to give them this information when you know they come and go all the time um so they might not they just might not know that these resources are out there and then again a big one is not knowing where or how to start with this information um, and that's again what i kind of tried to do with this presentation to the faculty to kind of help them and you know so far you did the legwork for them yay <laughs> right um so far i did have um we have a couple of professors that are already utilizing oer uh, before i even did the presentation um I mean, that's great that they're doing that. Unfortunately, it's classes that even if they adopted a textbook, it wouldn't be an expensive textbook anyway. <laughs> um, I was hopefully more directing it at, you know, the health sciences that have really expensive textbooks. Um, but I'm really glad that they're utilizing that and that the students see that this is available. Because um, even if that, even if their other textbooks aren't on there, at least they know that there's some supplementary re um, resources out there. Mm -hmm. um, like those simulation labs that I showed you and um, different um, resources that are there. If they're not understanding the content, then they have that to go to. Um, and I have had a couple of professors come to me um, asking 
um, for my help finding um, OER for their classes. Um, so I have had a couple of professors adopt OER since I've done this um, presentation. I'm hoping more will come. I don't know if it will, um, but I know the several students that I've talked to, they would really like for this to happen here um, just because they have so much more money that they're spending on other things. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something that starts small if this is, you know, at least a few are doing it and the word will get out. Um, and maybe um, student demand, once they learn about it in one class, they may bring it to the other more expensive ones and say some say something to the professors, hopefully. <laughs> say, right, yeah. Why don't you do this? This would be great if you could do this. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, I, I send out a like a bi-weekly um, newsletter about kind of what's going on in the library, um, if there's any changes and stuff. And I usually end all of my emails with, you know, if you need help um, finding textbook or finding textbooks or wanting to um, try open educational resources, let me know and I can help you. So I'm always putting, kind of putting that plug in their ear. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I'm just kind of hoping and waiting that more people utilize it, so. Um, yeah, these are, um, again, all of these are linked. Um, these are some of the LibGuides that um, I used as examples when I was um, making my presentation um, this time and um, the last time. I built it out much more um, from the last presentation because um, there's just more, even more information out there. Um, and I feel like, you know, OER is becoming so prominent now that, I mean, no offense to the professors, but really there's no excuse not to use it because there's just so much resources out there right now. It's um, yeah, it's not so new that nobody knows how to do it. Yeah, it's it's been proven and more other people have done the, the, the hard work of making it feasible. Right, and there's so many, um, I think it's on a couple of these um, OER LibGuides that there's, you know, universities out there that a lot of the courses or a lot of the faculty are, um, completely switching to OER. Um, like they're more OER than not for classes, um, which is really exciting and hoping yeah. we get there someday. Um, but these are just examples. Um, if you wanna look at them, um, if maybe there's some information that I missed and you wanna see what they're doing, I linked them out to um, the schools that I looked at. And then this is an open educational resource guidebook. Um, it's linked on there. Um, this just gives more information about it, um, more resources that are available. Um, and so I got a lot of information on this guidebook as well. Um, it's not super long, um, it's easy to read. Um, so if you wanted to utilize that, it's linked right on that slide. Um, and I think that's all I have. Is there any questions for me or? Doesn't, yeah, does anybody have any questions? Um, go ahead and any more questions, type into the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, if you wanna know more about any of the different um, OER services that Laura mentioned, you can ask about that or how, you, um, is anybody using this kind of thing in your university or college? Um, do you have any tips? for anyone else who might be <laughs> wanting to jump in here and, and needs uh, i think that's the, the, i think this uh, presentation actually would be great for anyone to use who is doing trying to do the same thing you are doing laura like i want i know this is a problem a, a need in our in, in our area in our college at our university and but i need you know this is the backup i need the, the research you know how do i how do i convince my faculty to do this um and I think all the resources here and, and what you've gone through so far <laughs> um, is going to be great for other people to do. Uh, now, your the the survey and questions you had at the beginning were from like 2018-19, correct? Mm -hmm. um, when did yeah. you do, uh, we do have a question, how long ago did you do the presentation to the faculty to try and convince them of this? I don't remember if that was... Yep, the first time I did this presentation was um, uh, February, last February. Um, 2021? Yes. Uh, okay. It was right, yes. 
um, yeah, last February. Um, it was right before I went on maternity leave. <laughs> That's how I remember. <laughs> um, um, so yes, last February I did this presentation. Um, so it's been about a year that they've known. Yeah, okay. Yep. Um, this is, um, I do want to, again, redo this presentation. Um, I'm working, I'm currently working on um, creating a survey uh, to send out to the students. I have to have um, IRB approval to do it. Um, so I, I have a process to go through before I can actually send out the survey. Um, but I want to hear from the students of what they're doing um, to get their textbooks. Cause you know, I showed uh, the survey findings on this presentation, but I wanna do my own survey here. Sure. Cause I have, you know, a big inkling that um, a lot of them are gonna say that they're using closed reserve and they're making copies or taking pictures of the book from closed reserve <laughs> or yeah, or they're um, utilizing their peers. Um, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's gonna be the two biggest answers I'm gonna get. And I think that showing that might I mean, I don't know if it will, but hopefully that'll give them a little bit more push because I know that, you know, I've heard from faculty that it's, you know, frustrating when they don't have the book in class, you know, they didn't do the reading because they don't have the book um, yeah, or whatever it is. And I mean, here, you know, here's your answer here. Here's where you yeah. can easily fix that. Um, I mean, that would be, that was, that's a question too. I mean, do these faculty just assume all the students are getting the books do they even know that this i mean that, that what happens in classes yeah why you know if that i mean you just said they they get frustrated why didn't you do the reading i can't afford to buy the book that you want us to yeah okay. i think they and then what are you doing as a faculty to fix that problem you just yeah <laughs> i think they know it's a problem um they just um they're relying too much on closed reserve which mm -hmm. i get um, but you know, that's not what closed reserve is there for. It's for the students, you know, if, if, um, you know, their textbook is still in the mail and it hasn't come to them yet, that's technically all the textbooks that are up there should be taken down after like two weeks, because by that point, all the students should have their textbooks, but, um, that's the supposed just, plan. Yeah. <laughs> right. But they're just, um, that's what it was supposed to be when closed reserve was first implemented. Mm -hmm. um, that, and that was before I came here. Um, but they're relying, I think they're relying that on that way too heavily, um, which then also kind of frustrates me because there's some professors each semester that are asking me to purchase the books. And I have, you know, not a very big budget, you know, it's a small mm -hmm. library, I don't have very much. Um, and so they're looking to me to purchase those books for them. And so, yeah, it's just frustration all around. And so that's why I tried to do this presentation to kind of fix that but but i'm i'm no, gonna after probably, I didn't this, know what could possibly what other options there might be yeah right and i'm hoping after i get the survey done i get all the data from that i'm going to redo this presentation to maybe those that you know weren't here for it or, or need a refresher or something and they can see that obviously this is a problem <laughs> and, and here's the current data. information from your own students telling them right this yeah. is how they're struggling yeah yeah <laughs> well it doesn't look like anybody has any other questions that they've been typing in just now at the end so that's fine um you all know where to find laura if you do want to um, talk to her more about this and what she's doing and, and how she's been able to work it out oh just some comments uh, fantastic presentation and a couple of thank yous <laughs> i think thank other you. people are going to definitely be using this in their um at their universities too Tell them and to if they have if you guys have questions obviously you can um email me as well so mm -hmm. Great. And and good luck, Laura. My fingers are crossed for you. <laughs> you. I know I was a struggling student myself too. Um undergrad oh, yeah. and it's it's not I it's understand. not thing to figure out. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. All right. All right. I uh, thanks. So thank you. Thank you, Laura, for this great info. Thank you everyone for attending. I'm gonna pull back presenter control to my screen now to uh wrap up and show you where we'll have our archive and everything right, here's this show page here we go our encompass live page these are our upcoming shows here but um at the underneath there is a link to archived encompass live shows and most recent ones are at the top of the list so this is last week's here 
Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me um, probably by the end of the day tomorrow at the latest, letting you know that the recording is ready. Um, it has to process through GoToWebinar and YouTube and everything, um, and it'll be posted here. And as I said, there'll be a link to the recording on our YouTube channel and a link to Laura's slides. Uh, Laura, you can send me the um, sharing link um, whenever mm -hmm. you get a chance, and we'll add that link in there. So you all have that information. Um, if you're looking for other shows, um, if you want to search our archives, we do a search feature here. You can search the entire show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want to. That is because this is our full show archives, uh, going back to when Encompass Live premiered. And I'm not going to scroll all the way down because there's just too many here. Uh, that is in January 2009. So um, we've got 11, 12 years worth of shows here. So just do pay attention um, to a, the original broadcast date of anything you watch in our archives. Um, some of the information will stand the test of time and still be good. Uh, some will um, become outdated. Services and products may have changed drastically since the original presentation. Uh, some might not exist anymore. You never know. Um, so just pay attention to when something was originally broadcast if you do go ahead and watch our archived recordings. Um, we do have a Facebook page I have linked here um, for um, Encompass Live. We do promote about our shows. Here's a reminder to log in today's show. Um, so if you do um, like to use Facebook, um, give us a like over there. Reminder to announce when our last recording went up and you can know what's going on. We also push uh, put it on, on Twitter and Instagram uh, using the hashtag Encomp Live. That's our little hashtag for the show. Um, so you can keep up on what we're doing there. Um, so that is for today's show. I uh, hope you join us next week when we were talking about WordPress. Um, the last Wednesday of every month is a uh, pretty sweet tech day. Um, Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian, comes in the show and does something tech related. So if you're the techie person in your library, this is definitely the um, show to be watching. To keep an eye on. Um, we do tech things during other times of the month, but definitely every last Wednesday of the month will be her. And um, WordPress just did an update, she told me, to their interface. And she's gotten lots of calls and emails with questions about it. So she has for her topic uh, next Wednesday, WordPress layout templates using Elementor. So I definitely sign up for that. And any of our other other upcoming shows you see we have here in March and April dates getting filled in. Uh, keep an eye on the schedule here as I get more of the other dates that haven't been um, scheduled, finalized. And so sign up and so um, join for any of our other future upcoming shows. Hope you'll see you um, on those. Um, also a reminder, uh, something else we do online, Big Talk from Small Libraries is next Friday, February 25th. This is our annual online conference, all online, all day long. Uh, free um, small libraries doing presentations. Everyone who is a presenter on Big Talk from Small Libraries are, is from a library with a um, population served or an FTE of 10,000 or less. Uh, Laura has been on there before, actually, previously. <laughs> um, our schedule is up. Uh, re registration is open. We have presentations from public, academic, and school libraries. So a little something for everybody. So um, if you are interested, every, so if anyone can sign up for it. Um, that is next Friday, February 25th. So sign up for Big Talk. Sign up for any of our upcoming Encompass Live shows. So hopefully we'll see you on a future episode. Bye-bye. Thank you.